Tonight, the Eglinton Crosstown fiasco takes an unexpected turn. Give us some space. Give him some space. Give us some transit. Years behind schedule and way over budget, the head of Metrolinx now refuses to put a timeline on when the embattled transit line will open. They also located a short distance away in a garden area an improvised explosive device that had not yet been detonated. Plus, crisis averted. Why police are saying a car explosion in Barrie could have been way worse. It was something that we never like set out to to achieve because we never thought it was possible. And cooking up excitement. A year after the first Michelin rankings in Toronto, we'll tell you which two restaurants are savoring the moment after being added to the exclusive International Club. Good evening, I'm Chris Glover. We'll get to those stories in a moment, but first, there are a couple of developing stories to get to, starting with tragic news from Vaughn that even the Premier is talking about tonight. A 10-year-old girl has died after she was struck by a vehicle in a townhouse complex. The pedestrian was taken to a local hospital where she tragically succumbed to her injuries. I don't have any information to suggest any wrongdoing at this time. It is still under investigation by our major collision investigation unit. It happened on Mullen Drive near Bathurst and Steeles at around 5.30 this evening. The driver of the vehicle that struck the girl remained at the scene, and there's no word on any charges at this time. Doug Ford taking to social media tonight to express condolences to the girl's family. And speaking of the premier, his government is also reacting to big news late this evening from one of the biggest teachers unions in the province. High school teachers have now officially agreed to a deal with the education ministry to forfeit their ability to strike. The Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation had asked members to approve a plan to go directly to binding arbitration in the event of an impasse in contract negotiations by October 27th. Nearly 80 percent of union members who voted supported the deal. This vote comes after the union's own bargaining unit came out against the agreement that it said would erode the union's power by taking a potential strike action off the table. Now, other unions, including the one representing elementary teachers, have already rejected the government's ongoing offer for a similar deal to go directly to arbitration if contract negotiations sour this fall. Now to the Eglinton Crosstown, and just when you thought the wait for the transit line couldn't get any longer, today there was an audible snicker of laughter as the head of the provincial agency overseeing the project announced to the public he did not feel comfortable providing a timeline for when the Crosstown might be ready. Keep in mind, the transit line was originally supposed to open years ago. Dale Manukduk looks at how people and businesses are reacting. I know this is the question on everyone's mind. When will the Eglinton Crosstown LRT open? Metrolink CEO Phil Verser was pressed repeatedly but wouldn't budge. And I know it's not popular to say I'm not willing to declare a date, but I have to be convinced, and so has my organization, has to be convinced that we're giving you a fair date that is fairly reason reasonably achievable. And so I've declared no date. I've been waiting for a long time because what I know, uh, they're going to open before two years ago. And now I don't want to ask more because they don't ask me, they don't tell me anything. And uh, do you want some spring roll? Suzanne Bazarte has been in business at Eglinton and Dufferin for 14 years. She's seen the entire duration of construction dating back to 2011. So I open late and close early. And not much uh, sales. Transit riders as well fed up with the delays, stuck waiting for buses. Waiting for actually like a bus sometimes like takes like 30 minutes. It might be another year or three years. <laughs> yeah. Most of the construction is completed, about 98%. The meat of the remaining work is being done at Young Eglinton Station. The delays come down to four things, the initial design, a technical defect on line one of the TTC, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the testing and commissioning phase they are currently in. Crosslinks Transit Solutions, the consortium building the project, keeps finding defects and deficiencies. Metrolink says it's already dealt with 1,400 of them. There's currently 225 remaining, but it could go up. And the public can expect to hear about it because while the provincial transit agency did not commit to an opening date, it did commit to bi-monthly updates. I can just say to you, give us some space. Let us.
come back to you and give you that feedback on where we are, what progress we're making, and we will report that every time we come back, every two months. He's asking them to give him some space. Give us some transit. Toronto St. Paul's Councillor Josh Matlow has been outspoken on the delays and wants accountability. Communities and businesses are suffering, and every day that goes by without the completion of this project means that people are not only having their lives hurt by it, but in some cases, people are losing their livelihoods. Matlow has been calling for a public inquiry into the delays ever since CBC Toronto obtained documents revealing there was no credible plan for completion. Meanwhile, the NDP are calling for Phil Verser to be fired. Verser's salary has increased from $100,000 in 2017 to over $850,000 last year. It makes him the fifth highest paid public servant in the province. Now, when pressed about his leadership, Verser said that he is accountable. He's also humbled to be in the position to take this project over the finish line. We just don't know when that finish line is. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. All right, to Durham Region now, and a man has been charged in connection with the death of a 57-year-old woman who was found on a road in Ajax. 56-year-old James Patton is facing four charges, including careless driving causing death, leaving the scene of an accident and driving with a suspended license. The victim was originally found in the area of Kingston Road and Harwood Avenue at around 5 a.m. last Wednesday. Police say she was lying in the roadway with severe head trauma and she was transported to hospital with life-threatening injuries where she died. Anyone with additional information is asked to contact police. Up in Barrie, a car explosion early this morning shook a lot of people out of bed and forced the evacuation of an apartment building just nearby. Police say no one was injured in the blast, but investigators quickly found and safely detonated a second explosive before it went off. Tyler Cheese walks us through the unnerving moments from the scene in Barrie. Barrie police have been investigating in this parking lot behind me all day. That's because a vehicle exploded here in the early hours of this morning. Police say the blast was caused by an improvised explosive device. They got the, to the scene around 3 a.m. after multiple 911 calls. They also located a short distance away in a garden area an improvised explosive device that had not yet been detonated. As a result of that, uh, an immediate evacuation of the uh, complex was ordered in particular to those residents who, who face out onto the parking lot area. Soon after, Barry's explosive disposal unit was able to remotely detonate that second explosive device. A specialized unit from the Ontario Provincial Police were called in to assist with the investigation. They used an explosive detecting dog to make sure there weren't any other devices in the area. Police say they can't share any details about the devices at this time as the investigation is ongoing, but detectives are currently canvassing the site and looking into near, any nearby surveillance footage. They're also asking anyone with dash cam footage or more information about the incident to contact them. City buses were brought in to take the evacuated residents to a nearby church for temporary shelter, and police say arrangements are being made to get them home as soon as possible. Most of the road closures caused by the incident has since been reopened. Tyler Cheese, CBC News, Barrie. Back to Toronto and to Queen's Park, where again today the opposition hammered away at the Ford government's plan to build Highway 413, trying to draw parallels between it and the now scrapped Greenbelt land swap deals. Lorenda Redekop is keeping her eye on those ongoing debates. Highway 413 is set to go from Halton to York Region. Today, the NDP suggested it's a road to another Ford government controversy. The highway is a gift to powerful mega developers who each own land along the proposed route. The highway is for them and not for the people. Given the Premier's apology and 180 on his Greenbelt plans, she had this question. Will the Premier scrap this terrible project and also return those Greenbelt lands? Ford touted his government's plans to build roads. We're going to continue to Order. focus on infrastructure, building the 413, building the Bradford Bypass and Highway 7. Current legislation allows building roads through the Greenbelt, but the housing minister has promised to introduce new, tougher legislation to protect the Greenbelt. So what could that mean for the highway? Critical infrastructure will be built uh, and can be built uh, as uh, per the Act and, and regulation as well. We'll continue uh, to, to do that. He also says the government campaigned on building the 413 and that people want it. The Green Party leader says the highway will take 400 acres out of the green belt and put 2,000 acres of farmland at risk. What? So people can drive 30 seconds faster? 
It makes absolutely no sense. It has nothing to do with moving people faster, and it has everything to do with benefiting wealthy Ford Connected elite land speculators. Take a look at who owns all the land along the 413. And you'll see many of the same names that you saw in this failed $8.3 billion backroom deal. Opposition parties also want to know the cost. The minister avoided that um, question. People expect the 413 to be built. Uh, they elected us to, to build the 413 and we'll continue to, to, to deliver on that promise. How much um, will it cost? Look, we've got a 10-year plan, $27 billion committed to, to highways. But building the 413 is stalled. First, the federal government is going to take a look at whether it needs to do an environmental assessment. It says it still has not received all the information it needs from the province. Lorenda Redekamp, CBC News, Toronto. And a live look for you at Toronto this evening. 16 degrees and there are some clouds out there. Victor Paolo is back with us again tonight. Hey there, Victor. A couple things to note when it comes to some headlines. We're expecting a cloudy overnight as well as a cloudy Thursday, but once all those clouds and temperatures behind us, it's going to be some warmer days and it's going to be a sunny weekend as well as we do have some clear skies in store. Average temperatures this time of year, 18.5 is your average high and 7.4 is your average low. Now looking at the reason we're going to get all the excessive cloud cover is because of the storm is coming up off the Midwest. If you do notice, it's bringing in a lot of rain when it passes by the Windsor area when it comes to the overnight Thursday morning. And it's also going to continue on for the Windsor area for the rest of Thursday. It's going to be a wet day for them. But over here in the GTA, you see it's going to be more excessive cloud cover that we're going to be receiving. Now, here's what your three-day forecast looks like. It's going to be a sunny but cloudy Thursday with probably a high of 18 degrees. It's going to be one of the cooler days of the week. But then looking at Friday and Saturday, you can see the temperatures are slowly starting to increase, which is definitely going to let you know that we have some warmer days ahead. Make sure to stay tuned to see what else is in store for your weekend weather and how we're going to start October. Over to you, Chris. All right, Victor, we'll talk to you again in just a few minutes. It has been a big night for some of the city's upscale fine dining establishments. The second edition of Michelin Guide Toronto was released tonight. Julia Nope was at the ceremony for us to find out which eateries made the cut. Champagne, music, and fancy food. Chefs from some of Toronto's most prestigious restaurants gathered tonight to find out which ones would get a coveted star. This is an exciting night for Toronto's culinary scene, but for the city as a whole. It's really a symbol of what uh, what we experience across across the entire city, seeing the depth of the scene. Tonight, two new restaurants here in the city were awarded stars, Capo Sato and Restaurant 20 Victoria. We're very really lucky, the quality and the hardworking people that we've had with us since we opened. All of this is owed to them. Four others were given Bib Gourmands, a status that recognizes great food at great prices. Two were given green stars for their focus on sustainability. When a, a restaurant is recognized by Michelin, it's a recognition of the quality of the ingredients, the quality of the preparation. The Toronto-based Michelin Guide made its debut just last year. 74 restaurants were recognized, 13 received stars. Quetzal was one of them. Since then, business has been booming. We're fully booked, like, uh, pretty much months in advance now. The Mexican-style restaurant opened in 2019, just a year before the pandemic. Executive chef Steve Molnar says the recognition, just three years later, was unexpected. It was something that we never, like, set out to, to achieve because we never thought it was possible. He says it's an honor not just for his restaurant, but for the city as a whole. First and foremost, it's going to boost tourism. It also gives us a kind of footing in the international culinary stage. Toronto food writer and editor Nancy Matsumoto agrees. You know, I think it's a big deal when it comes to any city for people who love food and they know the brand. It's kind of like, you know, you've arrived, you're in the guide. So what makes a Michelin-worthy restaurant? I asked the chef at Sushi Masaki Saito, Toronto's only restaurant that currently upholds two stars. High end meaning, very expensive, very gorgeous design. No, 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 not only. More high end meaning, welcome to my home. You can relax. Now the guide itself is digital, so it can be updated on a regular basis. It also includes some of Toronto's top hotel picks, allowing the city to cash in on its prowess as a tourist destination. Julia Nope, CBC News, Toronto. All right, not quite as exciting news coming out of sports tonight. The Blue Jays were looking to take a big step towards clinching a wild card spot tonight. The hitters have had against the change, but not this time. Judge crushes another one. This one into the second deck. 
Well, there's always tomorrow. Aaron Judge there with his second home run of the night. And the Jays dropping game two against the Yankees with a final score of six to nothing. Toronto is still technically in a position to make the playoffs. They can clinch a spot if they win three of the next four games. It is the last four games of the regular season. Welcome back. A lack of places to charge electric vehicles is expected to create a real speed bump in Toronto as the city tries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Olivia Bowden outlines the problem and what some are trying to do about it. Yeah. Charging supports yeah. all the other cars and then if you have a Tesla there's a little adapter. Andy Bazoian shows off newly installed electric vehicle charging stations at the building he manages in Toronto's East End. He was able to bring in the chargers thanks to a program run by the Atmospheric Fund, a regional climate agency. The program aims to install more chargers in more high-rise buildings. It's funded by the federal government. More and more people are switching to electric vehicles and eventually probably everybody will have to. Electric vehicle infrastructure has become a more pressing concern particularly for rideshare drivers that live in high-rises like Bazoian's building. That's because Toronto City Council is considering a proposal that would make all of them go electric by 2030 to help the city reduce greenhouse gas emissions. According to the city, a third of Toronto's emissions come from traffic, and 4 to 6 percent of that is from rideshare vehicles. When it comes to the ride-hailing drivers, this is actually a really important group that we think can lead on the electrification wave. Ian Klesmer directs strategies and grants at the Atmospheric Fund. He says they focus on helping high-rise residential buildings install chargers because that's where more rideshare drivers live. And the reason that we're focusing on these buildings is that ride-hailing drivers drive way more than the average commuter, often four to five times more per year and so they stand to save the most money. But if Toronto is going to implement green ride shares by 2030, it needs to ensure it prioritizes adding more chargers, climate experts told CBC Toronto. Olivier Trescasas, who's the director of the University of Toronto's Electric Vehicle Research Centre, says there will be serious equity issues unless those drivers can easily charge up. If you're operating a ride share, and you uh, simply cannot charge, then that's, that's a major problem the city needs to address. That issue is also something a longtime Uber driver in the GTA told CBC Toronto. He says lack of chargers, along with worries about the battery draining fast, is keeping him from using electric for ride shares. The city of Toronto is currently holding open houses so it can get residents' opinions about electric vehicle use. It says that it wants to ensure that electric chargers are available. Officials will also meet specifically with those that may be mandated to transition to EV first. We'll be having further engagement with, uh, with the rideshare uh, industry, um, with, uh, with the taxi cab sector, really to make sure we're getting their feedback. Professor, could you tell me what we're looking at here? In the meantime, at Ontario Tech University, Professor Sheldon Williamson is working to make the transition to electric smoother for all drivers. He and his students research how to make EVs charge faster, be more temperature resistant, and even charge wirelessly. He says the technology is only going to get better, but the infrastructure needs to keep up too. The demand will be there, so the so you know investing in developing the uh, the charging spots within residential units makes sense. Toronto's new proposal goes to council next month for discussion. Olivia Bowden, CBC. Back to Victor with more on the unseasonably warm temperatures. Victor. Chris, taking a look at the map of North America here, one thing we can note is you can see the warmer temperatures are coming closer towards us. Now, over Saskatchewan, not so much Alberta anymore, but uh, when you see Manitoba as well and Ontario and even western Quebec, all that yellow is working its way in. Now, what that means is we'll be having some above seasonal temperatures for the upcoming days. So if you're a fan of sunshine and you're a fan of some hot weather, well, the good news, we have some more in store for you. But speaking of tonight, what the temperatures will look like, it's going to be 14 degrees, a bit of cloud cover like you can see behind me. But the good news is in the Toronto and Greater Toronto area, there'll be no rain working its way through. But for the Windsor area, they will be expecting some rain tonight all the way through for Thursday. Now, tomorrow morning, your little ones are getting ready. It's going to be 14 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. Now, it's going to be a high of 18 degrees, not that much difference from the morning and around midday. But you definitely want to make sure you layer up because the best way to prepare for September weather.
Now, taking a look at what we're expecting from all that excessive rain that's coming off of the Midwest, that's going to be creating some extra cloud cover here. But then once it works its way through and we reach Friday, there's going to be another system that's coming through right here that you can see off of the East Coast. But the good news is if we get closer towards the weekend, that system is going to take a sharp right turn and exit towards the Atlantic. And that's going to leave us nothing but sunshine and beautiful weather when it comes to your weekend. Now, what's it going to look like? Here's what your first 72 hours looks like. It's going to be high of 18 on Thursday, high of 20 on Friday, high of 22 on Saturday as well. And looking at your overnight temperatures, they're remaining around the mid-teens. But when it comes to your Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you can see that the weekend is going to start to heat up when it comes to your Sunday with a high of 25 degrees. And look at that Monday at 26 degrees. Starting off October, it's going to feel closer to almost August temperatures as you have a high of 26, 27 on Monday and Tuesday. And one thing to note as well, as the temperatures do increase during the daytime, so do the overnight lows as well. So for those who packed up those air conditioners, they might be unpacking them maybe a little bit sooner. Hope you all have a great rest of your evening and over to you, Chris. Thanks, Victor. I hope you have a good evening too. All right, and finally tonight, we're paying tribute to a Canadian icon. Well, we're here today at uh, Little Canada. It's amazing to, uh, uh, to be able to see Terry placed in Little East Coast. Uh, it was amazing when we were uh, contacted by Little Canada a year ago, over a year ago, to add Terry, and uh, it's been a great process in doing that. Terry Fox's figurine was placed in Little Canada's St. John's. That's, of course, where he began the Marathon of Hope. Schools across the country are participating in the Terry Fox Run this month, which raises money for cancer research. And that's our show for you tonight. Thanks so much for watching. Maribel Tarouk has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6, and I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. We'll see you then.